Up next from the Stanford Social Innovation Review, Jocelyn Wyatt, Social Innovation Lead of IDEO, talks about her design firm's unusual efforts to build social enterprises and advise businesses in the developing world on Social Innovation Conversations. Hi, I'm Eric Nee, the Managing Editor of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And I'm Chris Deigelmeyer, the Executive Director of the Center for Social Innovation at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome to Social Innovation Conversations. Today we're bringing you a new presentation in the Stanford Social Innovation Review Talks series. For your convenience, we've made the visuals of this presentation available on our website at sic.conversationsnetworks.com. Org. Stanford Social Innovation Review provides leaders in the nonprofit, government, and business sectors with the ideas, tools, and skills needed to solve social problems. For more information, visit us online at ssireview.org. And now, here is our presentation in the Stanford Social Innovation Review talk series. It's a great honor to welcome Jocelyn Watt. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here and an honor to meet all of you today. Hello, uh, I'm Jocelyn and I'm from IDEO. And I'm actually not here to talk to you today about IDEO and share some stories related to the work that we do there. But I really want to talk today about design thinking and how it applies to nonprofits and the work that all of us do. So my work at IDEO has focused mainly on working with low-income communities in the developing world. And I'm hoping that what I have to say today can be applied more broadly to all of the social challenges that all of you address every day. So first, I wanted to start with a story to really get us in the right mindset. And for those of you that read the Stanford Social Innov Innovation Review article, I'm sure this story will sound fairly familiar. But this is a story about an Indian woman named Shanti. And Shanti lives outside of Hyderabad in southern India, about 30 minutes outside of the city. And every day she makes a decision to go to the local borehole instead of taking her water from the local water treatment center. So the borehole is about 300 feet from her house and she uses a three gallon container similar to the ones that you see in these pictures where she carries the water from the borehole back to her house every day. So Shanti and her husband rely on this water from the borehole which actually is not safe water. And they know that it's not as safe as the water from the local water treatment plant. But even though they occasionally get sick, they believe that since they and their families have been drinking this local water for generations, there's really no reason to change now. So Shanti has many reasons for why she takes the local borewell water instead of purchasing the water from the local treatment plant, but they may not be the reasons that you might think. It's actually easy walking distance, the local water treatment plant from where she lives. It's well known, she knows about the benefits of drinking safe water. And it's also affordable, it costs about 20 cents for five gallons, which is certainly something that Shanti and her husband could afford. But there's a few reasons why this actually isn't a good option for Shanti. The, the first is that the local water treatment center requires her to carry a five gallon plastic container that's rectangular and actually can't be carried on her head. It's designed to be carried on a bicycle or on a motorcycle, which Shanti doesn't have access to. Second reason is that you would think that then her husband could pick it up on his way to work or on his way home from work, but actually the local water treatment center is not open um, when, when he is going to work and it's already been closed by the time he comes home. And the third is that they only sell the water in a coupon, a monthly coupon for five gallons a day, and that's more than what Shanti and her husband need to consume. And so she asks, why would I pay more for water that I'm actually not going to use? So what appears to be a perfectly good solution in terms of delivering water to Shanti and her community members really isn't working. And that's the case because the people that tried to design this system actually failed to consider all the cultural needs of people living in this community like Shanti and her husband. So this is a missed opportunity 
that we can see in hindsight, but this is really all too common. So we assume, I think over and over again, that to address big challenges or big problems, we need to come up with big solutions. And that we think about these types of challenges as only being able to be solved at the macro level. So we tend to zoom out a bit too far and forget to focus on the details of the system and on the people that it needs to be designed for. So we create these ambitious programs with really lofty goals and end up not focusing on the people that they're meant to serve. So time and again, these initiatives falter not because, uh, not because they're not thought of and well planned and advanced, but because they're not based on people's needs and they've never been prototyped to really solicit that feedback. So the systems that we design in these types of programs really need to be designed for the people that are in them. They need local human solutions. So I'm sure you all recognize this. This is the iPhone 4 and it launched a few months ago. It's been a big topic of conversation, especially here in Silicon Valley. And this is an example of great design, but this shouldn't be the only thing that design does or that designers are thinking about. Design also needs to be part of these conversations too, about being part of finding solutions for people like Shanti. So how do we do this? So I'm here to talk about an approach that we call design thinking. And this is a process in which we look to understand the needs of people and to create new solutions to meet those wants and needs. So IDEO is an innovation and design consulting firm. Our headquarters are here in Palo Alto, just down the street. We started out three years ago, actually, coming out of Stanford. And we started out designing things like this and this and this. And in fact, these are probably the types of things that you think about when you hear the word design. And over the years, we've designed over 4,000 products and services and systems and programs. And through that time, we've learned a lot. So I wanted to share a few thoughts on design thinking, a few of the things that we've learned. And so some of these are stories and examples from IDEO's work and others are inspiring examples from other organizations that also use a design thinking approach, whether or not that's what they call it or not. So the first is to be human centered, but also to choose the right people to center that around. So this is really paramount to what design thinking is about and something that I've already started to bring up in this story about Shanti. So this is really about finding out what matters to people and designing solutions to meet those needs. So a, a couple of years ago, we worked with a multinational company that was looking to enter base of the pyramid markets starting in northern Ghana. And they asked IDEO to come in and help them figure out what was the appropriate mix of products for women to be able to develop micro-franchise businesses in northern Ghana to sell to their community members. So they were going to be going door to door with this basket of goods of health and wellness products and selling them to their neighbors at really low costs. So we were there to try and figure out what that combination was and to look at designing the branding, the packaging, the pricing, and the business model around this micro-franchise. So one of the products that we were considering was vitamins. And actually, you know, I've done development work for a number of years and, and believed, as did the clients that we were working for, as well as the other partners that we talked to and some of the experts, that no one in the developing world will pay for preventative medicine, especially things like vitamins. And so we decided, though, that we would test it out and that we would actually talk to people and gain an understanding of what it was that they really wanted and kind of put our assumptions to the side. And it was a good thing that we did because actually vitamins turned out to be the most popular item that we tried selling when we set up this mock shop on the side of the road in this village in northern Ghana. We were trying to figure this out and then really began to understand that actually we do the same thing with things like vitamin C. I start to get a cold and I immediately start to take vitamins to, st to stave off that cold. And so women, especially pregnant women and nursing mothers, were actually taking vitamins as a way to help them during that time and they weren't thinking of them as preventative but they were actually thinking of them as treatments or as medicinal. 
And so had we listened to our own intuition as kind of the experts flying in from the US or had we listened to the people who have built their businesses around this or to the local NGOs that have spent years working with these communities, we never would have introduced vitamins as an offering in this mix of products. But by listening to the people, by being human-centered, we were really under able to understand that vitamins could add more uh, than many of the other products that we are considering. The second principle is to move quickly from insight to action. So if connecting to people is really the, probably the most important of these principles, I would say this is a close second. Designers make things real. So we build things, we test things, we iterate, and we build things again. And we do this all very, very quickly. So I think a lot of times, many of the organizations that we've worked with in the social sector tend to move quite a bit more slowly than we're used to moving. And there's required the, a whole deal of paperwork and committees. And, and I think that the tools of designers are really some of the strongest differentiators in terms of getting tangible really quickly and moving from insight to action in a matter of days. So a coworker of mine spent some time in Vietnam and he was working on a hygiene project. So the task was to create a hand washing station that the community would embrace. And he actually was able to accomplish this within a week while working with the local community. So from going from understanding the needs around hand washing and hygiene to actually creating a product that the community embraced took him five days. And he did this by using design thinking. So he went out with his team and he talked to people and figured out what mattered and learned things that people preferred to squat when they were washing their hands rather than stand. And that they actually wanted clean and new hand washing stations. A lot of the ones on the market that the people were promoting were made out of used two liter soda bottles, which people really didn't prefer. So he then went about, after learning these insights, designing with the community, and built a whole bunch of prototypes that you can see in this picture. And he did that with local materials that he could get from the market. And so by getting tangible fast and by working collaboratively, it really allowed him to develop a, a design for a new hand washing station that could be manufactured locally. And all of this was able to happen in the course of a week. The third principle is to let prototyping trump expertise. So this harkens back to the first principle around being human-centered but choosing the right people. Um, when, when we're undertaking this process of design thinking, once we develop prototypes, we bring them back out into the world to get feedback on them. It's really tempting to bring these prototypes just to the experts or just to the partner organizations that we're working with or, or just to ourselves and to solicit their feedback. But it's really critical to get feedback from the users as well. I've spent some time with an organization called Perdan in India. And Perdan provides microfinance opportunities and business training for some of the poorest women in central India. And they wanted a way that they could bring together large groups of their borrowers on an annual basis to really reward the microfinance groups that had been the most successful during the year and provide them an opportunity to build their networks within their regions. And so Pranan said, why don't we try having a fun day of games and events with these women? And Everyone that they talked to, all these experts who have worked at the local NGO, said this will never work. Women in India do not participate in sports. They do not compete with one another. And they certainly do not show off in front of hundreds of other community members. But they decided to listen instead to the borrowers, to the women that were part of these microfinance institutions, and ask them what it was that they wanted. And the women said, sure, I mean, we've never, we've never raced before, but that sounds like it could be fun. And so they decided that they would prototype it. And so they tested it out on a small level. 
and it turned out that the women were extremely competitive with each other, that they actually loved undertaking these sporting activities, that the men were actually the ones kind of hovering behind and looking over the women's shoulders, but that the amount of pride that it gave the women to be able to perform and to compete in this way was really phenomenal, and the confidence that it built within these groups and the strengthening of the groups themselves absolutely achieved the mission that Perdon had set out. And so it was really important in this case not to listen to the common wisdom or not to listen to the experts, but to really test out this idea with the women themselves and see what would happen. The fourth is to embrace constraints. I think many of us when we're working in really constrained organizations, in my experience working with really small social enterprises and nonprofits in India and in Kenya, it's really easy to complain about the constraints that we face and find that they actually limit our creativity. But with design thinking, we talk about embracing constraints and that constraints actually force us to be better designers and force us to be more creative in what we do. This is a, another organization that I really respect called LifeSpring Hospitals. They're based in, in Hyderabad and they provide affordable maternal health care. So they understand the needs of their customers and recognize that so many of them are so cash constrained. They're willing to pay something to not have to go to the local government hospital, which tends to offer such horrible care. But they're not able to pay the high prices of the local private hospitals. So LifeSpring came in at kind of the middle ground in between those two. And they actually offer a variety of services depending on what their customers are able to pay. The healthcare is actually no different. The same doctors deliver the babies in the same ways, regardless of how much you pay. But they have rooms that are like this, which are divided by curtains, and the women who aren't able to afford the private rooms are able to get that same level of care, but they're able to trade off in terms of the actual services around the rooms that they're in. So this is a, a room that has about eight beds in it, and would normally be full of women who are all delivering babies or had recently delivered babies all next to each other. But again, perfectly hygienic and perfectly sound medical care. So they were designed uh, within the constraints that they were given, but really designed for the needs of those women. The fifth one is to be extreme. So this can be a bit controversial, and many times the partners that we work with ask us, uh, think that we're a bit crazy to be so extreme in many of the design solutions that we offer, but our job is really to push them to think about extreme possibilities. This is Vision Spring, which is an organization that I worked with previously while I was in business school, but then we've also had an opportunity to work with since I've been at IDEO. And they were looking to expand their model. They currently sell low-cost reading glasses to adults. They're looking to expand that model to provide comprehensive eye care for children as well. And so Vision Spring recognized that they actually understood the needs of adults in rural India and their eye care needs, but they really didn't understand how to work with children and realized that they needed to design the healthcare system and the screening process for kids in a different way than they had for the adults. So we went out into the field with them and we just started prototyping different ways in which we could screen the eyes of these children. And so when we first sat down the kids, we tried the standard process where the kid would come in, they'd line up, one kid would sit down, and then 20 feet in front of them, the vision entrepreneur would point to the E chart and would ask the children which direction the E was facing. So pretty standard procedure in terms of screening lots of kids in a school-like setting. And when we did that, though, there was so much pressure on these kids to get it right. They were so worried about failing that as soon as they sat down and they had to start looking at the e-chart, they would burst into tears. And so it really wasn't very helpful because then they couldn't actually articulate which way the e was going and we couldn't really get any indication of whether or not they could read the chart. And so we realized that through that prototype, that wasn't really the right solution, and so we decided we'd try again. This time, we'd try with the teacher. Certainly, the children would feel more comfortable if the teacher were screening their eyes because this was a woman that they saw every day. But still, there was something not right about the dynamic, and though the kids weren't 
bursting into tears quite as quickly, they were still really reticent to actually demonstrate which way the E's were facing, and really the process wasn't working very well. So then we decided, let's scrap that and let's actually have the kids screen each other's eyes. And so we had one of the kids get up and start to pretend to be the, the vision entrepreneur and point to the E chart and give the other children instructions in terms of cover one eye and then cover the other eye. And the kids actually treated this in a really profoundly serious way. So while they thought it was fun, they actually loved pretending to be grown-ups and recognized that eye doctors kind of acted a serious, professional way. And that was the behavior that they started modeling. And then the other children who were being screened also took the whole process seriously, despite the fact that it was their friend that was testing their eyes. And so, of course, the ultimate solution, you can't actually design a program um, to really understand whether or not a child needs glasses by having a six-year-old screen their eyes. But at the same time, this thinking was able to really push Vision Spring into thinking about how can you use children as part of that process. And so the ultimate solution that they came up with was that vision entrepreneurs or teachers would screen the eyes of the children but that other children would be the coaches and they would have buddies who would lead them through this process together. So by being extreme in the design solutions, we were able to back that off and then bring it back to a place that really made sense. So the six is to seed the movement. So this is really about getting things started, making them compelling and digestible, and then giving everyone a way in. So this is about spreading your mission more broadly beyond your individual organization. So we really can't forget that design is a catalyst and that if we use it effective, effectively, that it really does create movements. <coughs> So I think no one is really doing this better than Nike Foundation right now. If you haven't seen the Girl Effect video, and actually there was a new one that just came out a couple weeks ago, definitely go home and watch it. It's as good as the first one and just such a powerful statement about a movement and a way to energize people and get them engaged. It's a really simple communication about the power of including girls in the economy and focusing on girls in terms of economic development. It's a call to action, and it's really getting people motivated around this cause. Another great example is the collaboration between Pepsi and Good Magazine. This is the Refresh Project, and it's essentially an open innovation platform which invites everyone to think about how to make the U.S. a better place. Individuals submit their ideas and other people vote, and the best ideas get funded. So it's fantastic that they're doing this and that people are implementing great ideas, but it's almost more exciting that it, they found a way to get people to think about these problems and to get people engaged who haven't ordinarily been. So this makes us feel that we can all be part of making change in our communities. And this brings me to the last example, which is something that we're hoping that everyone can be part of, and we've actually spent some time opening up our own approach. So with the support of the Gates Foundation, we developed the Human Centered Design Toolkit, which is free and available for anyone to download. And since it launched about a year and a half ago, we've had about 40,000 people who have downloaded it and are telling the stories about how they're using it. So it's being adapted by students and professionals and professors and volunteers and organizations working throughout the world to apply design thinking and innovation to the organizations with which they're working. And the best part of this is that we're getting ideas back from the people that have downloaded the HCD toolkit. So through Twitter and through blogs and emails, we're hearing about the approaches that people have used in the field, their tricks and tips and techniques and the ways in which they've adapted this approach. And that's actually inspired us to move this platform online, something in the process that we're now developing. But recognizing that a movement is both what you put out into the world, but also how you listen to the people and get ideas back from them as well. So I wanted to talk through a case of a particular project that we undertook this summer. Um, and this really steps through the, the different steps of the design thinking process that we laid out in the Stanford Social Innovation Review article. So this project takes place in Peru. This is a picture of the hillside in Lima. 
And we started a project in June that was funded by USAID, the US Agency for International Development, and AED, one of their nonprofit contractors in Washington, the Academy for Educational Development. And the goal of this project was to increase citizen participation and voter awareness in Peru through the design of a communication campaign. So I'm not sure how many of you have spent time in Peru, but it's a place where there's large disparities of wealth that are really getting more and more extreme, especially with the mining companies from outside that are coming in and provide, providing large amounts of wealth to the wealthiest and keeping the poor really at the same level. So economic development in Peru looks great, but actually on the ground, it feels really bad to people. So the first step of the design thinking process is inspiration, and that's really about going out into the world and gathering inspiration through the communities in which you're working. So after we spent a couple weeks here in California conducting secondary research to understand the political and economic situation in Peru, read lots of World Bank reports and UN reports and economist articles, and then we went there and we spent two weeks in Lima and Cusco, which is in the Andes, and Tarapoto, which is in the Amazon region. And some of the things that we learned during this process, one is that voting is mandatory. So what happens in Peru is that people have these ID cards, like their licenses, and every time there's an election, they get a check mark on the back of it indicating that they voted in that election. And if they don't vote in that election, then the next time they go to renew their driver's license or to uh, register their children for school, they're actually fined because they haven't voted in the last election. So what this means is that really high levels of voting, however, citizens tend to be really disengaged. So they'll go to the polls and they'll ask their kid, you know, which box should I check? Or they'll just kind of check whatever it is, whichever name looks most familiar, or whoever's first on the list. So people are, are voting, but they really don't believe in democracy, and they're not in voting in an informed way. So we spent our time in Peru trying to understand what was behind this and what we could do to develop a communication campaign to address it. So we met with a whole range of individuals during our time there, from disengaged rural women who had never paid attention to politics in the past, to politicians or people that were on the path to becoming political leaders. We met with partner organizations. We were working with two local Peruvian government agencies and two local Peruvian nonprofit organizations. And we spent time in the homes of people and observing them while they were at work. This is a picture of a couple of my colleagues um, speaking to a woman in the shop that she ran. And we were asking them questions to really understand how they interact with their government and with their local and municipal and national leaders. Who do they trust in their communities and where do they get information from? Do they watch television? Do they ever use the internet? Do they read local newspapers? Do they attend political meetings? And this, we were also looking for these extreme users, so people that were both the most engaged as well as the least engaged, so we could really understand that range in the communities. So again, this phase of inspiration is really going back to that principle around being human-centered and choosing the right people to talk to and choosing a range of people to talk to, but really focus on understanding their needs. So we, during our time there, after spending the time undertaking those interviews and observations and seeking that inspiration, we went through a process of synthesis. And that process really led us to a number of different insights about people's behaviors. But three of those insights were, one was that people need to demand accountability. So the problem was that they weren't engaged because they didn't actually trust that their political leaders were going to be accountable for the promises that they were making. And in fact, political leaders were making tons of promises and then actually only acting on maybe 20 or 30% of them. So people needed to feel like they could hold their political leaders or their elected leaders accountable for those promises that they were making. The second was that people need simple ways to act. So it seemed too big to just say, be engaged in your government. What did that actually mean? So we needed to provide them with tangible, simple ways that they could actually take action. 
And the third is that we needed to find ways for people to take action in ways that they actually cared about. So there were certain issues like the environment and like domestic violence that people cared deeply about and were willing to act on. But we needed to find ways to connect that with the larger political system. So we then went through a process, the next phase after inspiration is ideation. And so ideation is about coming up with new ideas and making them tangible and developing them into prototypes. And so we ran a series of brainstorms, which is the way we come up with quantities of ideas, and came up with four campaign directions, showed those to the organizations that we were working with, and eventually narrowed it down to one overarching communication campaign that we would develop, which was called Actuaya, or Act Now. So we wanted to show it to our partners and to the citizens, but we wanted to make it as real as possible so that they would really understand how this campaign would ultimately be seen once it was rolled out. And we did that by showing it in context. So we actually created this series of pictures. This is um, the campaign painted on a park bench, and it says, are you going to just keep sitting there? Act now. So again, we're looking really to move quickly from insight to action by being able to demonstrate the design solutions in context. This is a, another demonstration of that. So this says, politics isn't above your head, act now. Or this is on a series of public stairs in a park, which says change happens one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, act now. This was a, a bit of a more radical idea, or to, to go back to the principle about be, being extreme, we wanted to show how people could hold their politicians accountable. And so this is um, a municipal building that we're showing could actually be painted with a scorecard, where when the politician is elected, their campaign promises are all written on the side of the municipal building. And then as, as, they, as they do them, they're checked off one by one. Yeah, <laughs> it, it could be very useful here as well, I think. <laughs> <coughs> And so this was a very controversial idea, especially when we showed it to the government agencies in Peru. <laughs> but it was one that was really provocative to them. And though they probably won't actually paint the municipal buildings with a scorecard, they may think about doing something like publishing scorecards or report cards in the newspapers on a monthly basis. We also designed uniforms for the staff of the NGOs that we were working with and the volunteers to wear at the local fairs that they were organizing so that they could really have this branded identity and feel proud of being part of this campaign of Actuaya. And we developed these invitation cards which provided people with these really simple ways to act. So these were about how to volunteer or how to form a women's group. And so this really demonstrates the, the principle of embracing constraints and I think you know, if we, we could have sort of fought against this and said, like, well, if we can't provide full instructions and full information because people don't have access to the internet and we're not able to provide them with the links to all the organizations that we could connect with, so we'll just forget this. But instead we said, let's embrace the constraints that most of these people don't have access to internet in these communities where we're working, and we're actually going to design these really tangible invitation cards and hand them out person to person at these community fairs. And then we created stickers that say, fix this, act now. And the idea was that people could put these on broken things in their communities, like, schools that were falling apart or bad roads. And so, again, this is really pushing them to... Yeah. <laughs> we actually have a whole set of them here that all of my colleagues are now putting around on things in San Francisco. <laughs> So then the, the final step of the design thinking process is implementation. And so this is where we bring those prototypes into the field and get feedback on them. So again, we're really looking to get feedback from those community members, from the users, in addition to getting it from the experts and from the partners that we're working with. So many of the partners, when we brought these um, concepts to them, especially the, the stickers in the municipal building, were really leery about this. And we believed that 
these, these bolder ones, though, would actually be sort of more responsive to what people were looking for in terms of finding ways to hold their politicians accountable and to voice their opinions in really simple ways. And in fact, through that prototyping process, that's exactly what we found. So much like we did in Ghana with setting up this mock shop with the vitamins on the side of the road, we actually set up shop in the middle of Cusco in the city center and had our nonprofit partners wear these uniforms that we had designed and stand on the side of the square. And we set up this table where we had these different posters and postcards and the stickers and invitation cards and then the photos of the campaign messages in context. And we really just stood back and observed as the people walking by came and interacted with the different elements and saw that they loved the stickers and they loved the municipal scorecard. And we listened as they asked questions to these volunteers and they gave their feedback on the different concepts. And we learned a lot through this prototyping process and really took it into account and we iterated on the ideas and, and came up with another set of revisions around these concepts, but really let those people in the community be the ones to give us that feedback, not by directly asking them which of these things do you like, but by seeing, like, do they pick up an invitation card to take home, or do they pick up a sticker, and which of these stickers do they like the best, and what do they think about this message, and where do they plan to place it? So again, this is really goes back to the, the principles of both let prototyping Trump expertise, as well as the, the final one, which is really around opening up. And so the idea here, again, is that we need to be able to share these campaigns and share these stories in our process and what we learned and the places where we messed up and the places where things went right. But it really is both for us as IDEO to be sharing the stories about this work and design thinking and how it's applied, but also for the partner organizations that we're working with in Peru to open up in terms of spreading this campaign and really sharing their messages with their country. So the last point that I want to leave you with is about the importance of bringing design thinking into nonprofits and into the social sector. Because Design thinking is ultimately about introducing or creating new choices. So we have an established way or many established ways of getting things done and we have the expected solutions that we've been trying for years and years and years. But we need new approaches and we need new opportunities and we need to create new choices to truly root these solutions in the needs of the people that they affect. Thank you. So I have, I'm going to turn this over to you in a few minutes to be able to apply some of these um, aspects of design thinking to the work that you've done. And so I have a series of questions for you guys to discuss at your table. But before we do that, would love to take some of the questions that you may have. Yes. How does IDEO select, select the projects that we undertake? So IDEO is set up as a consulting firm, which means that for the most part, really always we have clients that come to us and ask us questions or ask to engage with us. With the nonprofit organizations with which we work, we offer different rates than we do for the for-profit clients, but we also believe that it's really important for the organizations that we work with to come to us and say that they have a challenge that they want us to focus on. When we've gone after organizations or offered to do pro bono work with nonprofits or with startup companies, what tends to happen is that the design solutions that, the, that we create with them tend to not be implemented. And that's because they're not necessarily making that investment. And so we want to provide opportunities for as many organizations to work with us as possible, but also recognize that there needs to be some skin put in the game from the organizations as well. Hi. Um, how would you take a design thinking approach to something as broad as fundraising? That's a great question, and actually, um, we're, we're doing that right now with the American Refugee Committee, which is based in the Twin Cities. Um, you may know that the Twin Cities actually houses the largest population of Somalis outside of Somalia. And it was funny that ARC actually didn't have a program in Somalia until very recently. And the Somali community of the Twin Cities kept saying to ARC, listen, you're here, we're here, 
we really want to support you to have a program in Somalia. And ARC said, we just, ha we have absolutely no idea how we're going to get money from Americans to support Somalia. Somalia probably has the worst reputation of any country in the world. Every day we're hearing stories around piracy and terrorists going from the U.S., Somalis going from the U.S., going back to Somalia, and it's a really horrible situation. And so they said this is a challenge that IDEO could help us take on is basically how do you raise money for um, this program in Somalia. And so we went through the same process, actually, that I just explained in terms of first going out and really understanding the Somali community in Minneapolis, what are the challenges that they deal with, and what are their thoughts around giving and fundraising. And we talked to the donors, ARC's donors, and then other kind of normal Minnesotans and asked them about their giving habits and about their thoughts around Somalia and, and supporting a program in Somalia. And developed a, a, a campaign that they could use um, after quite a bit of brainstorming and iteration uh, that was called Minnesotan You Betcha with photos of Somalis <laughs> riding bicycles, going to a Twins game, going ice fishing, doing really typical Minnesotan things, and really claiming to be part of this culture. And then finding other ways like developing a taco truck of Somali food. They could go around because the Minnesotans weren't even eating Somali food. You know, it was a completely ghettoized community. And so finding a number of different ways in which we could actually connect Minnesotans and Somalis and Somalis and Minnesotans. And that through that and through kind of playing off humor and different ways of connecting people in really human ways, in the city in which they were living, that that could actually generate quite a bit of funding for this program that they wanted to launch in Somalia. So I would say the process in terms of fundraising is the same. It requires creativity or thinking about communicating new ideas in new ways, but that it really ultimately starts with understanding who those donors are and what is it that drives them to participate or to donate. The, uh, the model is pretty grassroots. Um, by nature, starting with the people who are most affected by the solution or the approach. How does IDEO support the movement, assuming success in the grassroots level? How do you operationalize a more systemic change if that's the goal, um, moving from the grassroots to then implementation of something that changes the broader community? Yeah. Yeah, so we really do start by understanding people at that local community level, but oftentimes look to design programs that then can scale from there. And so um, we worked, for instance, with Water Health International, which is a, a different water treatment plant, not the one that I was criticizing at the beginning of this talk. Um, but we worked with them because they were at a point where they had water treatment centers, the system was fairly well designed, but they needed to scale that operation. And so to do that, they needed to actually have more customers at each plant that were coming and consuming water every day there. And so for them, what we developed was a communication campaign around the importance of drinking safe water. And so what we did was we actually came up with a, a campaign where they would go um, and visit these different villages and have a fair where they would bring a microscope that was connected to an LCD projector and have people bring in samples of the water from their house. And they would show side by side under the microscope the water from the water treatment center and the water from the local borehole. And people would recognize suddenly the real difference between the quality of these two sources of drinking water. And through that, they were able to then increase the number of people that were getting clean drinking water in each of these villages, increase from about 30% of the population to about 70% of the population, essentially immediately. And so what that allowed them to do was then recover more of their costs and then expand their number of units so that they could actually reach more villages. So we do work with people once they've figured out that model on that first the prototype and then the pilot basis and then on a small scale, we work with them to either figure out how can you reach more people within your given geography, how can you expand into new service offerings or new product offerings, as well as how can you expand to a new geography. 
So moving your model from Kenya to Ghana, how do you understand, you know, really start to understand what are those cultural differences between Kenya and Ghana, and then how do you adapt that model to Ghana as well? So always really putting the organizations on that path to scale, but starting at that grassroots level. Hi, I'm wondering um, what percentage of your clients are domestic versus international? And um, so many of your examples were from international clients. I'm wondering if you could give us a couple more examples of domestic projects you've done. Sure. So just one, one note is that probably less than 5% of IDEO's work is working with social sector clients. About 90% of it is working with private sector companies, especially Fortune 1000 companies are the majority of our clients. And then we have a small part of our business that's working with public sector organizations. Then within the, the social sector work, the, the work that I've focused on, because my background has been in international development and social enterprise, those have been the types of projects that, that I've worked on, which are the examples here. Um, and we, but we have done some work domestically as well. So a couple examples. One is work that we've done with the American Red Cross around increasing blood donations in the US. So the challenge here was that the American Red Cross had really designed its whole system in, of blood drives for people from World War II generation that were used to going in and giving blood every month or every two months. It was a really regular occasion for them. And even though most of their blood donors today are younger and they're getting them through these blood drives or blood mobiles at offices or at universities, they hadn't actually redesigned that experience for that new generation of blood donors. And so we worked with them to redesign the space and the branding and really focus on what mattered to the blood donors today was the connection with other blood donors and about the feeling that they had of pride of being a blood donor. And so it was about really promoting the blood donors as opposed to the recipients of the blood donations. Another example is um, work that we did around public housing in Chicago, which was around finding ways in which to help people that were living in public housing for years and years move towards being independent and living on their own. And so we developed a whole set of financial tools and actually a financial advising center for these public housing communities that would allow the people living in these communities to be saving in really easy ways on a monthly basis and essentially putting their rent towards a down payment that could ultimately be used to allow them to get a mortgage and to move out of the public housing after several years. Hi. Your talk is the reason I came to this conference. <laughs> I'm so glad I, I heard it. Um, so what struck me about your case studies and your examples was the sense of humor. You said the word humor um, and playfulness and uh, creativity that's so evident in the materials and I guess the way your teams come up with the project ideas and things like that. Um, but so the nonprofits, you know, that deal with social issues and, and sort of weightier you know, topics. Um, how, how do you strike the balance between um, being lighthearted um, when the issues are so, like I said, so heavy, so weighty, and, and full of social meaning? I think that's a great question, and I think it's one that um, I think we've, I think especially I struggled with when I first came to IDEO. My, I had come from working in social sector organizations where we did take these issues so seriously and, and didn't employ humor or lightheartedness or creativity um, as, as frequently as we do now. And I think I realized that you can both be deeply committed and compassionate and treat the issues seriously, but you can also sort of unlock your creativity by having fun and using humor, and that those two things aren't in conflict with each other. And I think that what humor does is that it allows people to connect with each other really easily, and that allows for creativity to happen, and creativity allows for fresh thinking and new ideas, which actually leads ultimately to more impact. And so I think when we think that we need to be so serious and we need to me reading all of the academic reports and really focusing so exclusively on the data and on the experts. 
I think what that leads us to is, is the same as opposed to something new and different. And so when you're promoting innovation, I think the playfulness and creativity and humor are really critical to allow people to get into that mindset to be able to explore new options. Um, so another question is most nonprofits don't have a budget for a graphic designer. Um, is, is there like an association of graphic designers who are interested in doing pro bono work or some list or website that would connect people? Um, it's a great question. So, I mean, a few resources that I would recommend. One is Taproot Foundation. So Taproot actually is developing now a program where they're connecting designers to nonprofit organizations, graphic designers and website designers and branding people have always been part of that. And they're looking to bring in designers that do design work more broadly as well. So I would check out Taproot. Um, Another place to look is Change Observer, which is a great blog about the application of design to the social sector and to large-scale social challenges. And Design Observer has a job board as part of that. And so I think there's so many designers that are so committed to working on these challenges that so many of them are willing to do it for almost nothing or for free at times. And so reaching out to those communities and asking for the type of support that you're looking for, I don't think it'll be difficult to find designers that are seeking these opportunities and want to work on these challenges. Uh, yeah, Change Observer. Um, yes. Hi, Jocelyn. I don't have a question. I do have a comment. Um, uh, and like my colleague just before me, that's, this is why I came to this conference, this Management Institute. Thank Buckminster you. Fuller often said the greatest ideas are found in simplicity. Your six steps, I think, are simple, clear, and a recipe for transformation in our nonprofit sector that tends to get caught up in restraints. Get, tends to get caught up in looking at expertise rather than prototypes. And I can go through every one of your steps, but we tend to get caught up in all kinds of bureaucracy, and we need to break through that. And I think you've given us a wonderful recipe for that. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so why don't we practice now a little bit, and then we can come back to other reactions that you guys have. Um, so... Now it's your turn to try and do a little bit of design thinking or to think about, we're, we're actually going to spend some time more thinking about how you might do design thinking in your organization as opposed to doing it today. It's a bit hard since we're not in those communities where we're working. So first of all, I'll let you guys reorganize yourself. So if you're at a table with, by yourself or with two or three people, if you want to join up with another table, I think if we can get groups of somewhere between you know five and six people that would be great all right so now you guys are gonna first you can start off by introducing yourselves um, once I give you the directions but you're going to choose to work on a design challenge that one of you at the table represents so you can choose which of you is going to be the lucky recipient of the consulting services of the rest of your table and you're going to select a challenge that you face in your organization. So hopefully this is a really big, meaty challenge that you've been stuck on for a long time. So I've suggested a few challenges here, but I'm sure you guys can come up with better ones yourselves. So we frame design challenges at IDEO as how might we questions, which we abbreviate as HMW. It just sort of opens up the options. And so could ask a question like, how might we enter a new geography? So this could be, you know, you're moving from East Palo Alto to Menlo Park, or it could be you're moving your program from Kenya to Ghana. How might we offer a new service? So this could be like the question that Vision Spring had. Um, we want to start to work with providing eye care to children in addition to providing eye care to adults, or we want to move from developing an after-school program to a nutrition program in schools. How might we develop that new service or program offering? Or how might we raise awareness about our organization? We've been working in this community and no one knows about us. How might we change our brand or how might we think about getting the word out about what we're doing? Or how might we engage with donors in more creative ways? So this is question around fundraising, really. Um, but how might you think about interesting ways to, to get your donors to be more active in your organization or to increase your donor base? So you're going to select one of your organizations, and, and a question could be one of those, could be another question that you guys have, can think of. 
and I'm going to ask you to develop a research plan. So basically, what you're going to focus the next 10 minutes on or so is really coming up with how would you undertake this design thinking process that I just talked about. So how will you find the inspiration to help you answer this question and help you come up with new ideas? So a few of the things that you can think about are who would you talk to? So who are the people that you would interview or do observations with to help you address this challenge? Who's an unexpected source? So you know you can start off by listing the usual suspects, but then move beyond that. Who's an extreme user? So who represents either the person that will be most supportive or into this and least supportive or into this idea? Where's analogous inspiration? So are there other sectors? Are there examples in the private sector or examples in the social sector of organizations that are working in radically different ways than you are or in different challenges that you could learn from. And then what will you ask? So when you talk to these people, what questions are you going to ask them and what are you going to look for when you're doing these observations? So does anyone have any questions about the challenge? So an extreme user would be so in, in, on the Peru project, our extreme users were the, the rural illiterate woman who was checking the boxes blindly on the ballot when she went to vote in the election. And on the other side, the extreme user was the politician. So it could be, you know, if you're talking about a school program, your, your extreme users could be the A student and the failing student. Um, so basically who are kind of at the two sides of the spectrum because we believe that if we design for our extreme users that we're also designing then solutions that meet the needs of everyone in between. So I'll be around if you have other questions for me, happy to answer them. Um, but you guys have about 10 minutes and then we'll ask you to share back some of what you learned. <laughs> answer the following question. How is this approach different from your typical approach? So if you could talk now about how might you have addressed this challenge in your organization using an approach different than design thinking, and how is that different from the design thinking approach? So I'll give you another couple of minutes to wrap up in your groups. So could I get anyone to step forward to one of the microphones and just share what this experience was like in your group? especially interested in hearing how this design thinking approach is different from the approaches that you might ordinarily use in your organization. No, actually, I am uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Just wanted to tell you that I, your article with Tim Brown brought me here too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, just, uh, I was just hoping, where are the post-it notes? <laughs> <laughs> Where are the post-it notes? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we do typically use post-it notes and find them to be a pretty effective tool. I think in, in this phase around um, post-it notes we really use during that phase of ideation or coming up with lots of new ideas. Um, in this phase where we're really kind of planning out that process, I think it's more of a discussion-based process where we're actually kind of building on each other's ideas. I think the things that post-it notes facilitate are kind of micro ideas that are standalone that then you can build off of. But much of the process actually relies on these more open conversations where we're asking each other questions and building on each other's ideas. And so I actually did struggle with whether or not to bring hundreds of post pads of post-it notes today, but decided ultimately that this activity would be better facilitated as an open discussion rather than as a rapid fire brainstorm. Yeah. Hi. Um, we, we had a conversation which I think if, if you're on the receiving end of it might have been slightly intimidating because there was a lot of why, 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 why going on. And, but it was a really interesting um, topic because effectively it's a, it's a question of um, recognition in the community. The problem is the organization has been there for 40 years with the name and the city which was established after the organization shares the same name. So the board... Uh, saying that there's a bit of confusion out here, we need clear recognition, the city's not going to change its name, so we need to. But when you dig down into it, this is an agency that um, has receives referrals um, for the service, 
It's got very good, it's got very good recognition within the community that it serves. Um, it has absolutely no problems in that its services are fully utilized. Um, and when you look at it, and after going through the question procedure, um, it had been an entirely internal conversation between the board and staff, but none of the communities that are impacted by this had actually been touched. Nobody had asked whether there was a degree of confusion in those communities about the juxtaposition of the names. And so the useful thing about this process was that we were asking why, 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 um, in a way that hadn't actually happened up till now. So I don't think that's more of a comment. I mean, I don't think we had a question, more to say that it was an extremely useful process. Um, but the interesting thing was that it hadn't been gone through at all internally. Great. That is a fantastic example of really how I think design thinking and, and this approach of looking outside of yourselves and your own organization to the communities in which you're working can really help you get around some of these big roadblocks or challenges that you may have been facing for years. So with that, I think it's time for the break, but I'm going to turn it over to Regina first. Thank you very much for having me today. You've been listening to a presentation from Stanford Social Innovation Review. For your convenience, we've made the visuals of this presentation available on our website at sic.conversationsnetworks.org. Stanford Social Innovation Review provides leaders in the nonprofit, government, and business sectors with the ideas, tools, and skills needed to solve social problems. For more information, visit us online at ssireview.org. The post production audio engineer for this program was. Stephen Eng. Our website editor was Tamara Strauss. The series producer is Haley Tobin. This is Chris Deigelmeyer and Eric Nee on Social Innovation Conversations. Thank you for listening.